So having introduced the Laplace transform in the previous lecture, I thought it'd be helpful to actually work through an example uh, where we use the Laplace transform and, and just show that it gives us the same solution as, as we uh, got when we used the, the conventional uh, solution approach of finding the, you know, the homogeneous and the particular solution. Um, but before I launch into the example, I wanted to introduce uh, two functions that you're probably familiar with, but for the sake of completeness and to keep everybody on the same page, I just wanted to um, make sure that uh, they're well defined. So let me introduce two functions. And one is the heavy side and the other will be the Dirac delta function. So number one is the heavy side function. And hopefully you're familiar with this, or you may have uh, heard it called by other names, but uh, it can also be called the unit step function. Okay. And it's simply defined as h is a function of t. It's going to be equal to uh, 0 for uh, t less than 0 and 1 for t greater than 0. Okay, and if we were to go in and uh, take the Laplace transform, we can look up in our table and say the Laplace transform of h of t minus c, I'm going to show this first, your table shows that's e to the negative cs divided by s, but of course if c is 0, so it's just h of t, then this top term becomes e to the 0 power, which is just 1, so that we could write the Laplace transform of h of t uh, equals 1 over s. Okay, so we can we can easily graph that. So let's draw a, a simple graph here. Okay, so there's t. This is h of t. Right, so the function is is 0 for all time before 0. And at 0, it instantaneously jumps to some value 1 here. And then it stays that constant forever. Okay? The second function I want to talk about is the Dirac delta function. So, uh, so the Dirac delta function. Uh, probably you've heard of this as well. Um, we define this as delta of t is equal to 0 for t not equal to 0 and infinite. Uh, when t equals 0. And so we can also look up in our table the Laplace transform of that. So uh, just like we did with the heavy side, if we have delta of t minus c, then we end up with a Laplace transform that is e to the negative cs. And if we have just the Laplace transform of delta t, that of course, this becomes e to the 0 power. So this just becomes 1. Okay, so what is this actually? Uh, it represents a singularity, right? It represents a singularity uh, at t equals zero. Okay, uh, it's also the derivative of the heavy side function. Okay, and is the derivative of h of t. One thing to note about this uh, Dirac delta function that's that's worth remembering is that it can be integrated. So, so it can be integrated. And and again, this is not a pure math class, so I'm just telling you the answer. We're not deriving this, but it if we integrate from negative infinity to infinity of delta t dt. Well, obviously it's zero anywhere anywhere that t is not equal to zero, so it's the same as integrating from uh, zero minus up to zero plus uh, delta t dt, and that is by definition one. So we integrate over effectively infinite um, value times a, a zero width, and we end up with one. So that's that's a, the definition of the Dirac delta function. So now let's go ahead and start our example. Okay, so let's write that down. Example, and it's one we've solved before, but we're, we're going to do it again using Laplace transform to show we get the same solution. So let's just say consider a Maxwell element. Um, okay, 
Uh, so a Maxwell element, which we've talked about extensively before, uh, subjected to the following loads. Subjected to uh, an instantaneous stress, and we'll call that stress sigma naught. Okay, and uh, at, that occurs at time t equals zero. So at t equals zero. So using the definitions that we've just created, that would tell us that uh, we could write the stress as a function of time is equal to the heavy side function t uh, h of t times sigma naught. Right. So let's go ahead and call that equation one. Now let me just give you, we're not deriving this because we've already done it in previous lectures, I'm going to give you the governing equation for a Maxwell element. So I'll just say recall, right, the, uh, the governing equation for the Maxwell element looks like eta times epsilon dot is equal to uh, eta over E times sigma dot plus sigma, right? That's our governing equation for the Maxwell element. So here's our solution. Well, we want to use the Laplace transform technique, so what do we do? Well, we're going to take the Laplace transform of both sides of equation two. Right? So first, take the Laplace transform of both sides of equation two. Okay. Remember, Laplace transform is an integral method, so if we have uh, a sum in the integrand, we can break that into separate integrals. So what that means is that we can take the Laplace transform of each term here separately. So let me, let me write uh, what this looks like down. This looks like eta times epsilon dot, Laplace transform of that is epsilon dot bar, equals eta over epsilon. Uh, these are just constants that we could have pulled outside of the integral uh, for the Laplace transform. Uh, times sigma dot, the Laplace transform of that is just sigma dot bar, and then the Laplace transform of the stress, sigma bar. Okay, let's call that um, equation three. So, remember in our last lecture when we, did, we, when we introduced the Laplace transform, we talked about uh, these special rules for derivatives, right? So we want to apply those now. Okay, so say apply the Laplace transform rules for derivatives, right? And I'll remind you of what that rule was. Uh, that said, for example, f dot bar, if we had some function f dot and the Laplace transform of that was going to be equal to negative f zero plus s times f bar, right? That's, that's the relevant rule for this particular problem. Okay, so if we apply this to equation three, then this looks like eta. Uh, applying this rule then looks like negative epsilon evaluated at zero um, plus s times epsilon bar. That's going to be equal to eta over e. Now apply this rule again. That's negative sigma evaluated at zero plus s sigma bar. And then this just r remains plus sigma bar. Okay, go ahead and call that equation four. So now we have to, uh, if you recall from our previous lecture, uh, when we have something occurring that's discontinuous at zero, we typically are going to choose the whatever the value is at zero minus, just a just a uh, um, infinitesimal amount before zero, right? So uh, we choose. Uh, zero minus uh, to evaluate our initial conditions. Okay, our ICs as we'll call them, initial conditions. And what that tells us is that before time t equals zero, epsilon and sigma are both zero, right? So what we can write then, uh, if these are going to zero, is we, we end up with uh, eta, times s times epsilon bar is equal to eta over e times s times sigma bar plus sigma bar. Call that equation five. Okay, so 
I just want to point out here that what we've done, right, we took that uh, that differential equation and we've converted it in this equation, well, actually even back in equation four, but we've converted it to an algebraic equation, right? This is no longer a differential equation. So let's go ahead and solve. Uh, we're going to go ahead and divide by a to s. So divide by a to s, and we end up with an epsilon bar is equal to, uh, let's see, 1 over e times sigma bar plus 1 over a to s times sigma bar. Let's call that equation 6. What do we do now? Well, we know what sigma is, so we should be able to use our lookup table to figure out uh, what sigma bar is. So let's just say we use the lookup table uh, for the Laplace transform, right, that I've given, or you can use a, a web resource if you want. Um, uh, use the lookup table for the Laplace transform of equation 1, right, which was that sigma is equal to the heavy side function times sigma naught. And what we find is that, what we find is sigma bar uh, is going to be equal to h bar of, of uh, s, right, the, the Laplace transform of the heavy side function times sigma naught, which is just a constant. From our lookup table, we know what the, the uh, Laplace transform of the heavy side function is. This is just 1 over s. So we end up with that sigma bar is equal to sigma naught over s. We'll call that equation 7. And then we're going to substitute 7 into 6. Okay, so substitute uh, equation 7 into 6. So when we do that, we have then the epsilon bar is equal to, um, let's see, sigma naught over e times 1 over s, right, uh, plus sigma naught over eta times 1 over s squared, right? Let's call that equation 8. So now we're ready. We have um, epsilon bar, the Laplace transform of the strain now, as some function of s, right? Now we need to take the inverse Laplace transform to actually put um, epsilon back into the time domain, which is what we're trying to solve for, okay? So how do we do that? We uh, apply uh, an inverse Laplace transform uh, to equation 10 or sorry, to equation 8, rather, uh, to um, uh, put epsilon bar of s back into the time domain. Okay? So let's do that. So from the table, we have the following. We can say that the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s, we already know that, right? That is the heavy side function, h of t. And we also can look up and see that the inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s squared is just equal to t, okay? We'll collectively call these equations 9, all right? So then we can, we can now take the inverse Laplace transform of equation 8. So taking the inverse uh, Laplace transform of equation 8 now gives the following. Well, what's the inverse Laplace transform of, of uh, epsilon bar? It's just epsilon. So we have epsilon of t equals your sigma naught over e. Inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s we just showed in equation 9 was the heavy side function plus sigma naught over eta. Inverse Laplace transform of 1 over s squared is just t, right? And we end up with sigma naught times 1 over e plus t over eta. Call that equation 10. Okay, one small thing to note as we, as we finish up is that uh, because equation 10 uh, is only defined for t greater than 0, 
Okay. Only defined for uh, t greater than zero. Because of that, then we can just write that h. Whoops. I screwed up. I already gave you the answer. This should have been h of t. Right? Then h of t, because it's greater than zero here, is just going to be equal to one. And so we can write that epsilon of t is equal to sigma naught times 1 over e plus t over eta. Let's call that equation 11. Okay? I just want to point out that equation 11 is identical, right, uh, to the result that we obtained when we talked about the creep compliance. If you want to go back to that lecture, look at equation 7. This is identical to uh, equation uh, 7. Uh, from the creep compliance lecture. So I know that was a, uh, a relatively straightforward problem, but hopefully it covers the, the general approach that we were, we're going to take when we apply the Laplace transform to the, the types of equations that we're going to uh, encounter during the course of uh, this viscoelasticity discussion.